Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. I'm Josh Davis. Michael Freeman. And if you'd like to be a part of the discussion during our live tapings, please check us out at youtube.com slash user slash cur of anarchy on Mondays at 9 p.m., 6 p.m. Pacific. And you can see the final product on the air at youtube.com slash user slash voluntary virtues on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And please check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash cur of anarchy. If you're here during the live taping right now, uh, you can post any questions and comments to our threads we've made on the, uh, on the page. And you can do that, or you can send a Facebook message to us, and we're going to get to that. Holly Cogburn runs Homebody, a body care, vanity, and cosmetic products company. She contracts using USD, Bitcoin, and barter. She is proud to say that she started the business without the assistance of bank loans. In her words, fuck bank loans and fuck their interest rates. For the most part, fuck banks. She has paid her startup costs out of pocket and has steadily and sustainably grown from there. She believes in a free, fair, and reputation-based market, relying on word of mouth. So please, find Holly at homebodyco.com or facebook.com slash homebodyco. Yeah, uh, we have a special guest with us. Uh, his name is Jeff Justice, and he's at jeffforjustice.com. Uh, hello, Jeff. How are you? Hi, guys. Joshua, Michael, nice to meet you online. Absolutely. Hi. Finally, after all these months. <laughs> so we've uh, been discussing on and off like uh, this debate topic about um, what anarchy could look like in the end and uh, what, our, what we hope for uh, in the future. Um, but yeah, um, uh, can you introduce yourself first, Jeff? Sure, I'm Jeff for Justice. That's the number four, not the word for. And I am just sort. Of, I self-describe myself as an activist. I have a unique situation of living out of my vehicle by choice, which I've been doing since 2010. Although today I'm at a uh, my friend's house using Wi-Fi here, so we can connect and chat. And I do homeless outreach and uh, different types of activism. And some of that's not consistent with uh, voluntarism or anarchism because I, I, I have um, an attachment to still advocating for the advancement of alternative parties. Um, so we could talk about why I even bother with that uh, as sort of a uh, hypocritical stance, I guess, or this duality that I have. But anyway, um, I'm... I'm Regarding voluntarism, because this is an anarchist podcast, right? So I self-describe as a wannabe voluntarist, and I say wannabe because, I mean, I don't entirely live as a voluntarist because we can't, I mean, it's impossible unless you're really good at living off the grid, perhaps. But obviously, if there are sirens behind my vehicle, I'm going to pull over when I would prefer not to because I don't want to be shot by these people with their guns and their attitudes and all that. So uh, that's why I say uh, wannabe because uh, there's only so much uh, of a voluntarist we can be. And that uh, conflict not only goes with the statism imposed on us, but with my own struggle of um, materialism versus self-sufficiency and things to that effect. And um, I've been learning about this, these concepts of voluntarism and anarchism I'd say since the past two years, I think, approximately. And I learned a lot through um, a lot of the prevailing podcasters, such as Adam Kokesh, Chris Cantwell, Larkin Rose, those uh, Derek Freeman of uh, Peace News Now. Those are a lot of the people that I've uh, done my learning from. Um, and so here I am, and I've gone through this evolutionary process of um, you know, learning that what I feel is what I think it makes sense for the future, for the world, is um, for humanity to emancipate what I call the three fear-based systems of control, and that's government, religion, and market. So we'll probably disagree perhaps about the last one, uh, which is uh, emancipating from market, but certainly as anarchists, we would agree that humanity emancipating from government would be a great thing. Uh, Absolutely. You mentioned that you live in your, your truck by choice. Yes, SUV. SUV, okay. Uh, you might, could you explain that a little bit? Yes, in 2010 I started living out of my vehicle by choice. I was uh, working and making the most money that I've ever made, and I was still living paycheck to paycheck even though I live non-materialistically. Um, pardon me, I, I, I guess I should be looking up, right? So <laughs> pardon me if my eyes look weird because I'm still getting acquainted with um, doing these live hangout things. 
But anyway, um, yeah, I started doing that because I got tired of living paycheck to paycheck, and um, I wanted to save money. And even though I was not, um, you know, I'm not materialistic. I don't go blow a lot of money. Did that answer your question? Um, yeah. So, so this was more of an economic decision, not a philosophical decision. Yeah, it started out to save money. Sorry, I didn't clarify that part. So it basically was just about saving money. Then it evolved for me into um, discovering the freedom of being able to come and go geographically <clears throat> uh, so I can be in whatever city I want to tomorrow. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I appreciate that freedom. I think it's it's kind of weird living in a house now because to me that's just a box. I mean, the box might have windows, but there's so much. And I've only got to travel up and down California. I haven't even got to see the other 48 inland states. So I think there's a lot of freedom that comes with it. But whatever freedom we have is always limited by, you know, the, what the state imposes on us. Yeah, that's that's a very, very cool, cool concept. Um, yeah, uh, so Michael, you wanted to talk uh, about a couple of news pieces before we get into the actual interview here. And um, or, uh, there was uh, one simple thing, uh, and that's uh, Lysander, Lysander Spooner's birthday is today, I believe. Is that correct? Today, yes, yep. Um, you know, yeah. he was a 19th century philosopher. I, I, I can never say this damn word. Economist. Um, <laughs> He wrote such things as, you know, um, a constitution of no authority, which uh, was was pretty inspirational to me in my phil philosophical journey. So I figured we would mention that. I'm sure a lot of our viewers are familiar with his works. Absolutely. Yeah, he's a big deal because uh, um, to me there were only really two um, uh, anarchists from uh, the 1900s to 1800s. Uh, even further back, uh, and that was Spooner and Proudhon, and I don't really like him, but uh, Spooner I like. Uh, but that's that's just a general statement, and uh, I know much more about Mises, and he's an economist, so it doesn't really mean a heck of a lot, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's my two cents. Cool. Um, uh, actually, um, are are there any books over the past couple of years uh, that you've been uh, reading uh, by any anarchists or even econo um, economists? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you're getting into my head, Michael. <laughs> Maybe I don't remember. This may have been something we debated because I met you on a Facebook group uh, sometime last year, and I'm meeting Michael now for the first time. And um, I don't do a lot of learning by book. I, I don't know if I have a, a learning disability when it comes to reading, but to me, like, if I look at a book and there's a lot of words and pages, my mind just turns to mush and I cannot um, do that. So I learn more by podcast, and uh, that's, I've, you know, I told you a lot about a, the podcast people that I listen to, so I do more of my learning by audio or visual. Uh, pages and pages of stuff just overwhelms me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm kind of the same way. Um, I've been doing TV uh, ever since high school, and um, you know I can read a book, but it'll take me about a month to do so. So <laughs> uh, I'm a very slow reader. Uh, yeah, I'm but, the uh, complete opposite of that. I read, I <laughs> open a book and I cannot put it down until it's done, and I'll kill, I'll kill a thousand-page book in six hours. Nice, nice. nice. No, it's actually not that that much of a good thing. It's kind of like an obsession, borderline addiction. So, <laughs> you know. No, no. Uh, there are a lot of writers and readers that will do that same thing. Um, but um, honestly, uh, actually, that kind of brought up a like a very small anecdote. Uh, a friend of mine brought up a or, or has a rule that if you pick up a hamburger, you have to eat the whole thing. You cannot stop, put it down, a, a, eat a couple fries. You can't have a Coke or anything like that. I know it's a total side, but whatever. What's the ration behind that? Uh, What's the, the reasoning no, behind that? No, nothing. There are, there's, it's just a personal rule that he has. <laughs> I think it's okay. funny. Um, anyway, moving on uh, to other serious things. Um, yeah, what else did you have on your plate, Michael? You had a couple 
uh, um, pieces? No, really just one. Um, there was this movie, it was more, more of a Patriot kind of thing, which isn't my speed per se. Um, but this, this movie was in production called Grey State, um, which is more about, or less about a American Revolution um, current day. And I believe last night, and I'm sorry I don't remember the guy's name. I'm, I dropped the ball on that one. Um, but he was found dead in his house with two gunshot wounds to the head, and his family was dead as well. They're calling it a murder-suicide. Um, and, like, I'm not going to say that the government did it, but the government did it. <laughs> like, <laughs> this guy was, uh, you know, promoting relatively freedom-based media that would have created spawned a, more of an opposition to the state. They, they'd be... It would, would have been in their best interest to kill this guy off. Um, I haven't even researched it. I'm not going to really bother wasting my time. I don't dig into conspiracy theories and stuff like that, but in my opinion, it, it would... It would it seems to me like the state killed the guy. Right. Um, yeah, actually, the, the thing is, um, I kind of believe what you're saying because... Uh, there have been a lot of suicides by bankers across the globe over the past, uh, I believe, just three years or four years, um, all because of 2008. Maybe maybe this started before that. Uh, there have definitely been over 100, and um, you don't hear about it in the news, but that's a big news piece. You know, when you hear so many suicides by bankers, um, that's kind of messed up. Uh, it, it's basically like they know something. It, that's all it is. And uh, that's really disgusting. But also, um, all of these, uh, you know, what happened in France and, what was it, Belgium, I believe? You know, the, uh, or something like that, the terrorism over the past couple of weeks? France. Uh, in France. Yeah, there was one other as well. I believe. But anyway, uh, what they want to do is instate some kind of, uh, you know, Patriot Act for Europe. And uh, that's just, that's going to be a bad time. You know, that's not going to be good for traveling at least. But, um, you know, it's going to lock us all down basically. And, and who would be um, the authority here? The, the European Union or NATO or? Uh, who, who knows? Um, uh, I wish group I remembered. Of, group of bad guys X? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> what does it matter? It's something that, you know. Anyway, uh, but yeah, let the conspiracy theories intensify. That's all. Let's start with this. Um, so, <clears throat> let's start on what we agree upon, Jeff. What do we agree on? We agree that uh, government is, I'm not going to say immoral, you may not agree with that. <laughs> what, I'm, what I may agree with is that government is uh, bad for everybody, uh, everybody else, I guess. Um, and religion, yeah, we all agree that religion is uh, uh, a system that um, divides us. Yeah, basically that's the whole point. Government divides us and religion divides us. Um, is that about right, Jeff? Yes, and, and the, uh, you know, I call these the fear-based systems of control, and I identify three of them, which is government, religion, and market. Right, right. Now, that's the part that I disagree with. Um, right. But, uh, so you, you were mentioning that um, anarcho-capitalism, you were saying that that's a, uh, is that something to start with? Is that a starting point for people? Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm, I'm not sure, and I'm going to present this as a theory to you because this is not something that I have uh, solidified and can definitively say that this is the way things ought to be for humanity, but this is the theory that I'm proposing, and I feel like it's been an evolutionary process. I told you about uh, how I, I came to learn about the concepts of anarchism and voluntarism. I don't know, by the way, if I should keep saying those are two different things. To me, they're more or less a synonym. I don't know that there's a, a distinguishing factor there, but so I'll just say voluntarist. And um, for my fans who I hope are watching your show, and I'll be uh, sharing this uh, once we're done, um, you know, this was an evolution process, and it's it's both um, 
you know, it's a challenging thing to go through emotionally. Um, and then, um, well, I guess that's it. You know, to, to sort of come to um, sort of an epiphany that your ideas of looking towards uh, solutions through government and political figures when you've been doing it all your life is not what you should be doing. And that can be a, a hard process to go through when you've invested so much. Obviously, as a gay man, I spent a lot of time in political activism trying to get equal rights from government for uh, gay and lesbian folks. And so uh, in my process, you know, I finally, for my analogy, I guess, is like you shed the skin or you, you go through that metamorphosis and you finally have that aha moment. And I, I don't remember any one aha moment. It was probably more of a gradual process of listening to those various podcasts uh, by, <coughs> by the people I've mentioned. And finally, I started to realize that, yeah, these, these ideas of these, um, that, that first of all, I realized, okay, anarchism is not the scary word that people make it out to be. And as a gay man, I've already learned not to conform to society anyway. I've learned not to conform to society when I was voting outside the two-party system and uh, advocating for alternative parties. And so here's just another option, uh, or here's just another way in which I'm saying, okay, a lot of society seems to think we need uh, this mythological idea of government, and it turns out, no, we don't. Mark Stevens, by the way, of No State Project is another um, great resource that I've learned from. And so, uh, but where I differ, I've come to sort of a different point where I, I feel like I'm the student and all these teachers I've been learning from, I'm taking a, a different direction. and that different direction uh, involves this idea of market or money or barter or whatever we want to call it. And not only do I personally think that we don't need it and don't really care to advocate for it, um, that's why I'm not particularly excited about Bitcoin, although I'll concede there's probably more I have to learn about it and it would do me good to interview a, a Bitcoin person one day. Um, but I, I just think that humanity will um, I, I think that whenever humanity reaches a point of emancipating from government, if we can, which that's another question and sort of right there is will we actually reach a, a post-statism era or not, or will statism kill us all or continue to perpetuate? Um, I, there's a part of me that really fears that it's going to kill us all in some sort of nuclear war showdown from all the religious zealots and, the, um, and all of the... Um, nationalist patriots who want to always continue war and all that nonsense. But if we do somehow uh, prevail and get past statism, I think that that would coincide at such a time where money also becomes relevant. And I think uh, part of the conversation that I often don't hear with a lot of um, prevailing voices in anarcho-capitalism is that societal norms change so much century to century decade to decade, generation to generation. Uh, as a gay man, we've already seen such a societal change on the topic of LGBT issues just in our lifetime. So I think that some of the societal norms that will change is the idea that we need to trade, the idea that we need to uh, exchange money or barter or have some sort of trade-off. And the solution is as lovey-dovey, as hippie-ish, as corny as this may sound, I think the solution to uh, barter systems, monetary systems, market, whatever way you want to call it, is simply loving, coexisting with each other lovingly as we already do, generally speaking, in the nuclear family unit. And I think that another part of this conversation that's important is this uh, post-statism era, this post-market era, this post-religion era that, that I'm envisioning, um, part of that includes uh, getting rid of what I call the supremacy delusions. So the supremacy delusions come with religion, which convinces people that they are the chosen ones and they are the special ones because they believe in this book and they practice these customs and blah, blah, blah. And then the other supremacy delusions are through nationalism, the USA, USA man mentality that, you know, we've got to chant and root for our imaginary made-up borders. And once we get rid of those illusions, what reasons then do we have to hold on to money, I mean, to, to hold on to uh, resources or knowledge? We have no nothing to do at that point other than just share them freely, as many of us are already doing. 
Examples of that are on the websites freecycle.com, couchsurfing.org, and even what you and I do as podcasters, as YouTubers, we are often providing a service which is basically free. I mean, I'm guessing you're not charging viewers right now. I'm not charging viewers on my YouTube channel. And so we're already putting out a lot of content as infotainers or entertainers or uh, educators, whatever way you want to paint us, for free. So in a way, we're already doing it. And I think a lot of prevailing voices of anarcho-capitalism are doing it. But I think they presently have incentives to continue to promote Bitcoin or gold or silver or something to that effect. So I suspect that's a good reason why it's not very t uh, popular to engage that idea. Um, but to me, that that's my theory, so I'd be happy to unwrap that with you and see if you think it holds up or not. Um, yeah, Michael, did you want to go first? I feel sure. like you have an answer. A uh, couple. Um, that's a <laughs> couple answers, yes. Um, I do not think that, I, in, at least in our life, I'm going to guess you're 26. Thank you so much. I'm 34, though. Wow, right on. Um, awesome. Maybe I should go, go move into my, into my car, huh? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't think that we're ever going to see, a, I am ever going to see post-state society, unfortunately, um, at this current rate. that They are much more likely to kill us all, and they're already doing a pretty, pretty good job of that. Yeah. Um, I actually I like money a lot. I like to trade. Um, I thoroughly enjoy it, especially when I'm doing it outside of the arm of the state. I like my stuff. Nobody's gonna get my stuff. I own my stuff, and I, my time is mine as well. Nobody's going to be stealing um, my labor. That's for sure. Um, now. What I think some people fail to understand, or and this is just my opinion, this is just my spin on it, every single human interaction is an exchange. Every single one. An exchange is a trade. That is, in my opinion, that is, this is money. What we are doing now is exchanging ideas, right? We both find it mutually beneficial or we wouldn't be doing it. So we both gain here. We are both gaining something from this exchange. Like, do you, you do see where I'm going with that. Mm-hmm. So, so, and you, you do make a good point. Um, well, I guess I'm going to twist one of your points up a little bit. How you say you are a wannabe voluntarist, right? Right, yes. Um, I mean, you could, you could apply the same, uh, the same logic to, to money, right? I'm, um, I just trade, and I trade on unfortunately the black market and the gray market okay, it's not unfortunate to me but it's unfortunate that they have to exist in the first place um, so I'm a wannabe a wannabe tradesman if you will you know um, other than that though I agree with everything that you said right and I, I should also add to that that you know I've identified as a wannabe voluntarist and really what I'm doing pretty much all my life is surviving by any means necessary and I happen to choose what I feel are good uh, actions as I do that some people obviously choose uh, actions that hurt people I think you know I'm certainly no angel but I've uh, done a good job I think overall of choosing good actions uh, for my own benefit and then also for the benefit of the people I engage with and obviously I care about my reputation and thanks to that effect so therefore it's to my advantage to be good and I sort of have the, um, the theory of you know we all are raised up when we lift one another up and no matter whether I'm in a time of uh, prosperity or poverty uh, to, to try to live that way but I think no matter how anybody labels themselves I think in reality that's what we're all doing we're all basically surviving by any means necessary and thankfully that uh, is not at such a point where you know we're uh, in a major conflict where we have to resort to steal or kill or anything like that so um, but who's to say you know if, if things you know if the if it all hit the fan and things started to crumble and there was a uh, people there who had the last piece of bread and I didn't would I fight them for, for it perhaps I don't know um, that self-preservation that I'm talking about, I would, of course, extend to my significant other if I was partnered or my children um, or my immediate nuclear family. Um, but that's it. I mean, otherwise, we're all just basically surviving by any means necessary. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, 
Oh, go ahead. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I don't think we're surviving by any means necessary because if you save up, then you have the ability to not have to go and be violent, you know, totally against what we're saying. You know, we're trying to be uh, good, you know, to each other, then why would we try to fight each other? You know, it's completely opposite. So if you save when it's the good times, as opposed to overindulging, then you're able to, uh, you know, save up for the hard times and you won't be fighting everybody. Uh, you know, that's why trade and saving is so good and why, in that sense, capitalism is a good thing. You know, like um, why we need to uh, profit off of the trades and the, the services that we provide in the market. And that's why the market is so good. You know what I mean? Um, you're able to you're able to put in your work, and other people value that. Therefore, you're able to um, save up for troubled times when the economy is in a slump. And normally, obviously, the market wouldn't be in a slump when the government doesn't exist, because or normally, you know, the waves are much. Uh, um, much less hazardous, you know. Uh, the the uh, bubbles do don't exist uh, as much um, in a free market, or they wouldn't. Um, uh, and <clears throat> also, um, going back to the idea of your supremacy delusions, um, I think you're right when it comes to nationalism and uh, religion. Uh, I think we can all agree that um, there is no right deity because potentially there is no deity um, or and obviously the nation is held up to a s standard of being a de deity therefore theoretically it's su supreme but the market is just um, competing currencies competing monies competing uh, products um, all competing for um, people to decide on which product is best or which currency is best. Therefore, um, there is no actual supreme. Uh, it's just supreme for each individual. That's where I'd go with all that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to t touch on one one idea. Um, I don't think that that a, a moneyless society is possible without a state, and I can tell you why I think that quickly and easily. I disagree with the notion, again, you're not going to take my stuff, and the only way to paraphrase what you said, to boost other people up, is to take other people's stuff. And if other people don't want decide that they don't want to do that, you have to force them into it. And the only way to do that is with a centralized, centralized force, which is a state, in my yeah. opinion. I'm going to address that, but um, one one more thing about so, – uh, please remind me of that point, and I'll get back to that in a moment. But uh, uh, to Joshua's point about supremacy delusions, I think there, uh, therefore another important conversation that needs to be had as we discuss uh, anarchy is also the idea of – we talk a lot about non-aggression – uh, non-aggression principle is sort of being the uh, be-all standard of human behavior in a post-statism society, and I I'm, uh, I, I'm not sure that that is it. I think that morality is subjective. I think that good and bad are subjective, but I think that we all have to compete for our ideas of good and bad and perpetuate them and hope that they become the prevailing norms of uh, society. So, for example, here, this is a lame example, but it's the only one I can think of, so bear with me. But if somehow in one of these uh, African nations where they uh, have the kill the gays bills, if somehow there was a group of the anarchists and voluntarists who somehow got that place transformed to being a post-statism area, and it was prevailingly hostile towards LGBT people to the point where they felt that killing gay people was an acceptable behavior or imprisoning them, um, and that, this is in a um, so therefore I guess what I'm trying to say is not only advocating for non-aggression principle I think that you can't just leave it at that I think that you have to advocate for specific um, rights and wrongs and I think we talk a lot about that in anarchism and voluntarism circles with reputation currency um, so I'd be curious yep. of your thoughts on that if 
before you uh, before I address um, what you were talking about of how we like our possessions and a moneyless society without statism. I, I like the concept of the non-aggression principle. It's a really good idea. I try really hard to apply it to my life, but as you said, I, I don't believe that morality is objective in any way, shape, or form. I don't believe in truths or absolutes, um, but I do try to apply it to my life, and, and I think that it's it's not complete. What comes after? How how what what you know? Just um, solely using property rights as the way to form a society is is lacking, in my opinion. Just like the the money concept, yeah. um, how do we enforce it? How do we make it happen? I don't believe in DROs or private police or private militaries or anything like that. Um, so yeah, you know, I try to apply the the nap to my life, but. If my girlfriend or dog is starving and the couple next door has a block of cheese, I will absolutely – I'll start low, but if it comes down to it, I will kill them for it, sure. Yeah, that's, that's what I was talking about by survival by any means necessary earlier. And uh, to that effect, you know, often in the anarchy and voluntary circles I hear complaints about present-day statism behavior like a parking ticket or getting stopped by the police or criminalizing marijuana or something like that, throwing a – person smoking a joint in a cage. Um, but hypothetically, these scenarios could still exist in a post-statism era if uh, anarcho-capitalism continued by people's own foolish actions of getting in contracts which may allow for them to be in situations where they've subjected themselves to agreements uh, that wind up with the same consequences of punishment. So to me that goes to that point I was just making a moment earlier where to me it's not enough just to hold up the standard of non-aggression principle but to advocate for other standards and I think an accompanying standard uh, and I got this idea from uh, a famous uh, atheist, I think his name is Bill Har oh, Sam Harris, the guy who was um, uh, on, made headlines when he made his comments about Islam on Bill Maher a couple months ago and he and Ben Affleck were having a debate. Um, what he says about uh, his, his idea is basically does this behavior, does this action cause more or less human suffering, which is pretty measurable. We can measure human suffering and brain waves and things to that effect. So um, there's perhaps one accompanying standard with non-aggression principle is, is this overall hurting humanity. For example, there's supposedly reports uh, by organizations claiming that the 85 wealthiest people are, I, I hope I'm getting that number right, but something like the 85 wealthiest people have as much money to end poverty several times over. And to me that is an example of a prevailing norm amongst, if that's true, that means the morality of the those people who have the means to end human suffering is to, their, their morality is that it's okay, that that suffering is okay and that they are not obligated to change it. So I think accompanying um, social norms, I, I, this goes back to what I was saying about how social norms evolve uh, and I think we have to advocate for social norms that do harm reduction towards people. I, uh, I guess I'll take this. I think that um, there's a if you're thinking about the non-aggression principle being like the end all, you know, the principle here, then uh, yeah, that they did it right because I think they are were probably using corporations to their, their advantage, um, which use governments to their advantage, and uh, you know they, that's subjective. They want um, the uh, they want the government to assist them in whatever way, shape, or form that, you know, they got all the money in the world and what are they going to do with it? Nothing. They're probably just going to end up spying on us or something instead of, you know, <laughs> feeding the hungry, like you said. Now, with, now, my thing is, I think um, we have value judgments that say that uh, we want people to stop going hungry, but I wouldn't call that morality. I think the, in my point of view, the only morality is the non-aggression principle. However, we all have values uh, that are subjective, and uh, their preference. And uh, I, I don't know why I'm going to go down this route, but um, <laughs> so I think our moralities are different. Like you said, our subjective moralities are different, but um, the aggregate sum ends up being objective and that 
usually ends up being the non-aggression principle. That's it. So I think that's why everybody acts so such like a such an asshole to you know their fellow man, and uh, you uh, the three of us wouldn't have it. We wouldn't have that. Um, but in any case, um, the point was um, what we. Uh, I, I guess what I want to do is go back and uh, say that if the government and these corporations didn't exist, because corporations can't exist without a government, um, if if they didn't exist, then the market would end up treating everybody equally, you know, um, or yeah, treating everybody equally. Not saying that we'd all end up equally. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well. You know, regarding what you just said about, you know, they're jerks because they're not, you know, they're indifferent to the suffering of humanity. Uh, yeah. I guess I'm so PG-ish here. I don't, are we allowed to cuss here? <laughs> okay. Yeah, but, go ahead. Uh, all right. So anyway, um, you know, that goes to supremacy delusions. My, my conclusion about why they would behave uh, indifferently to the... Um, uh, prevailing poverty and, uh, you know, starvation that happens is because they have supremacy delusions that they think that that's okay and that they are the superior people, so therefore they are entitled to uh, a better quality of life and to, to be the special elite who are privileged to have the best food, the best stuff that doesn't break, the best ability to have funds to travel and things to that effect, and everybody else is inferior to them with their supremacy delusion. So, you know, therefore, um, you know, now you, you talked about non-aggression principle, and I do I want to ask a question. I mean, is there ever a point where you would still, if it was a matter of life and death, you know, if you were starving and, you know, I think you're in a relationship and I don't know if you have kids, but if you were uh, in a situation where you had your children and you were starving and these rich people next door were letting you starve and not sharing anything with you, do you think you would break at some point and say, you know what, screw in a non-aggression principle, I'm going to uh, choose self-preservation as my highest priority and value right now? Um, I don't know, uh, but I mean, I, I don't like lifeboat scenarios. I don't usually like to answer them because they're very specific. And um, so I don't know, but I know that as of right now, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't because um, I didn't earn it. Um, did I do anything for them? What can I do for them to earn it uh, in the, the limited time that there is? Um, can I wash their floors? I don't know. Maybe I can do something for them, you know? Um, so, no, I won't resort to stealing most likely. Um, especially where I know that I can save up capital right now, because I have. Um, and I, I know that uh, a lot of people can't. Uh, it's very difficult, obviously, especially if you're in California. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, seriously, I really doubt that I would. I, I'm not aggressive. Well, perhaps these people have supremacy delusions. I think you're in a, in a racial relationship, right? Yeah. Am I right about that? Um, so perhaps they're racist. They don't like black people, so maybe they don't want to accept your work, and that that's it. So now you and your family starve because you choose to have a, a value of non-aggression principle over self-preservation. But you're resourceful. I mean, I hear what you're saying. You would obviously try to do what you can to prevent that from happening. I'm giving you a scenario, but in reality, this does happen. This is happening when we hear stories about uh, mass starvation and we see the commercials of the skeletal-looking you know, uh, probably in some African country person, or whether we're looking at war refugees uh, at any number of conflict zones at any given point in time. Uh, this is happening, but the difference is it's not a real imminent impact on us, so we have, I think, an acquiescence to, you know, trying to change the system incrementally, um, but if it was more of an immediate uh, threat to us, I would be surprised if we would hold up non-aggression principle in those dire times. But I, think that, that. I think we have uh, evolved to some degree beyond that. I mean, you've mentioned it yourself. Uh, you know, uh, over time things change, and uh, within the last 50 years at least, uh, maybe 100 years, uh, we've gone beyond uh, racial boundaries. Uh, actually, we were one of the last countries to get rid of slavery, as far as I remember. But um, I do know that um, you know, if I can't uh, feed my 
children, and I no, I don't have any children right now, but if I did have children uh, and I were in a tight situation, I'd figure something out. And, um, it, you know, maybe I don't have to go to that one family or that one guy that uh, has that piece of cheese that you were talking about. I don't think we're at a point of survival right now. Capitalism brings us more than just needs. It brings us wants. Um, you know, I've got umpteen games in my closet over there. I'm a board gamer, you know, and I really shouldn't have these board games because I, I'm just a lucky guy right now. That's all. Um, uh, I'm intelligent, but I'm yes, I'm resourceful, but I save. You know, I'm not gonna like just spend willy nilly. Uh, I don't, you know, that's not what you should be doing. If you're poor, you shouldn't feel stuck. You should try to save up and try to. Um, you know, gain your ground slowly, or at least for your children. You know, that's what I would do. Well, that, I mean, that reminds me a little bit of the famous uh, clip that went viral when Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank said, you know, oh, the uh, it, it was in response to that report that the 85 richest people have as much wealth as, um, I forget, I forget whatever the number of, the bottom 135 million people or something to that effect. And, um, you know, where in America, where even if you're in poverty in America, you have probably a higher chance of uh, emancipating yourself, but not necessarily. A lot of people get some, uh, stuck in generational poverty, and there's not, and there's many factors, including um, you know mental health factors that play into that too. But um, people in third world countries, I can't imagine it's as easy as you know. I just save up. I mean, and probably many of them are working uh, for capitalists who are profiting off of their labor while they make in effect slave wages. Okay, so I'm going to use this as an opportunity to rehash the question that I had earlier, and but use it um, still in, in the context of this conversation. So I think where where we're headed, what what we're talking about, the direction this is going. Let's use Ancapistan and Ancomistan, our our countries right next to each other, right? And there's a uh, lo large amounts of people in Ancomistan starving, where in Ancapistan, the rich, you know, Mr. Moneybags just sitting there with his monocle, counting his counting his bills, right? Um, if I was in that position personally, I would help people. Um, however, I don't believe in stealing, and what, what what we're getting at here is how do you force them to to give away their stuff to these other people for whatever that your reasoning is? It doesn't it doesn't really matter. How do you force them to do that without a state? That was your question earlier, right? That that you addressed earlier, Joshua. Did I am I correct? About how do we? You were asked. You made that point earlier, and sorry that I lost track of that. Uh, you're talking about how can we have a cashless society without any kind of force or coercion, right? That's right. what I meant earlier, but I, I just tweaked the question to fit this conversation. All right. I mean, so in either case, to, I'll answer that question, which is voluntary persuasion. That's all you can do. And when voluntary persuasion doesn't work, what do you have? You have what exists presently, which is statism market and religion and so all I can that that's the answer as simple as that you can only voluntarily try to persuade people and I think again that coincides why uh, hopefully in a post statism era it would also coincide with the end of religion and the end of market because um, those values would have to simultaneously coexist and that brings us to the question then you know Again, social norms change, so I hear what you're saying, and what you're saying is not different than how I presently feel. Uh, you talked about, you know, you like your possessions. Well, I, you know, I live out of my SUV, and when I have it set up after, you know, getting all my work done in it, I like it the way I like it. But these are today's social norms. I think the social norms will be that your feeling of I like my possessions and my feeling of I like my possessions, I think these will become obsolete norms. I think these will become outdated human behaviors replaced by people lovingly voluntarily sharing because that is the alternative to market. And I hope that uh, I'm not presenting a false dichotomy. Maybe there's other alternatives that I'm not thinking of at the moment. But um, that's as far as I can tell uh, to either have a market, what's the alternative to that? To lovingly voluntarily share knowledge and resources. and 
there comes a quote there's a lot of questions with that such as is there really such a thing as finite resources I'm not convinced that there are um, but I'm open to the idea that perhaps there's evidence out there that shows there is really such a thing as finite resources but I think when you take away the hindrances of human productivity which I would argue is government religion and market then people are uh, able to flourish their creativity and creations and innovations which can uh, create technologies that can do things that we can't even imagine. I mean, right now we're lucky enough to live in the age of YouTube and the internet, where we can go in line online and look up videos of kids creating uh, amazing things that we couldn't have even thought of when we were uh, their age. So I think that you know these are s social norms that are going to change. Uh, yes, volunteering uh, your time is money, in my opinion. Uh, time is money. Um, Time is time is the scarce resource. That that is not necessarily infinite because you have a a lifespan that is X amount of years. You don't even know how long you have. So your time is valuable, and we need to make sure that we know uh, we can uh, put something into the economy slash the community. And gets because to me the market is the community. The community is the market. So if we put something into the community um, for free, then that's of our own volition. But if we want something out of it, we should be able to get that. And if somebody uh, thinks that our time was valuable to them, then they should give us something back in return so that uh, it's a fair exchange or maybe not even just. Whatever they can is always good, right? If it's agreed upon, I guess that's the whole point. If that's volunteering. You know, you volunteer your time or your resources in exchange for something else. So the, that, to me, is the market. That is the market, a transaction, multiple transactions going on. Um, when, when we talk about greedy capitalists, what you're talking about really is corporatists. And to me, that's a totally different di dichotomy because they're uh, forcing uh, you to uh, help them, really. They have limited liability, most of them, and that comes from the government. The government steals from us. So really, the market isn't at fault. It's the government, once again, because they're enabling those greedy capitalists or the corporatists. They're not actually capitalists. They're not capitalists because it's not voluntary. State, it's state capitalism. Yes, indeed. Well, well what, what they are I, is people with supremacy delusions who believe that they are entitled to create uh, uh, a class of different people. And, you know, I don't know how much you want to go down the conspiracy theory uh, of whether this is a certain group of people. Uh, whether it's certain family lines, things to that effect, is it a new world order, is it an Illuminati, who exactly is the they? Uh, there's all these interesting charts that we could look up online that show a uh, connectivity between corporations often having uh, the same leadership people in this corporation who happen to also be in the same leadership uh, positions of different corporations and all this kind of weird interconnectedness. There's all these graphs showing how many of the presidents are related to each other and all this kind of thing. So I think yeah. that we're, we're, we're still talking about supremacy delusions there and why do these people want us to be their in effect servants is because they have these supremacy delusions and until those supremacy delusions go away I don't, I don't see things changing, and unfortunately, so many of us are conditioned into uh, loving our subservience and loving our slavery, and you know, having this uh, Puritan work ethic that you know, if we are uh, working, hardworking Americans, then we're doing good, no matter if it. But we don't step back and look objectively, like, is that good for our health? How does that impact our family when we're working a 40-hour work we can take from them? So I see what you're saying. Yes, these, these cap, these. Um, these uh, greedy monocle people are not, uh, I think you said they're not capitalists, they are extensions of statism. Um, but, you know, to that I say that's because they are powerful enough to buy statism. So, if, you know, then, th then this really presents an interesting question I'd love your guys' insight on. And I really, this may sound like a silly question. I don't know the answer to this entirely, 
Um, but that really begs the question of what came first, religion, government, or market? And why did these three things evolve in the timeline that they did? Do any of you guys have any insights on that? And uh, uh, That's relevant to what we're talking about because I think it begs the questions of why do we do these human behaviors we do? Why do we have these, why are we born into religion? Why are we born with these these prevailing um, religions all throughout the world and the propensity of being believer? Well, there's a book called The God Part of the Brain by Matthew Alper. No, I didn't read it, but I heard his interviews on Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell, and uh, he makes a really interesting point how he believes that uh, believing in God is an inherent trait in most of us, but all inherent traits, there's a there's a curve, and that's why there's some atheists, but that's why the majority of people. I'm doing a bad job of explaining that, but the point is um, these behaviors that we do of religion practices, uh, governmental practices as, as quote-unquote citizens, and as engagers of market or barter or whatever, why do we do them, I think, is an interesting question to ponder, and that then brings to question of the origin of these behaviors. Why did we even as human beings start to do these behaviors? And now that we, as we analyze whether they're good for society going forward, whether they're good for us, we, we clearly all seem to agree that one of them is bad for us, which is statism. We all agree on that one. Then, you know, I think it really serves us well to examine these questions. Why do we continue to do these things? Are there alternatives to them? And what is the origin of why these were ever necessary to begin with? And I think it goes back to primitive supremacy delusions in the uh, caveman era when everybody was a, in hyperimposed in tribalism. I believe that the market came first. I believe that the market probably began when the first two cavemen um, helped each other hunt or caveman X helped the other caveman sharpen his stick. That's a, that's a trade right there. That's, that's the agora already in play. Um, religion... Statism is a religion. I do not find they are not separate, in my opinion. They are, there are deities. And all of the criteria are met by both to to interchange and to swap with each other. Um, I don't know when. I don't know who or why. Um, but I just know it's a really, really bad idea, and we need to find solutions outside of the use of force and violence and coercion. Um, there are uh, websites that pop up. If you do an online search for timeline of humanity, um, you can get these different websites that will come up and you know have different uh, information presented about uh, these sorts of things. But I have yet to find a really clear answer. But I think it's a fascinating question because then again, it really we are in a time where there is sort of an atheism movement growing. There is these uh, voluntarist anarchist movements happening. And yeah, we are in a time where we're questioning the social norms that are so prevalent today. Thank goodness for that. Um, but yeah, it is scary also to ponder, are, are we actually going to evolve to a point where, where it becomes obsolete? But back to this um, area of disagreement that we have about um, money. You know, you guys, please let me know if I'm understanding you correctly, but I think you guys are sort of categorizing almost everything as a, as an exchange, as a currency, right? I mean, love, your time, I think Joshua said, time is uh, something uh, Joshua said. So, but in terms of uh, the romantic human beings that we are, you know, we're not in our normal daily lives kind of thinking that way. Like, when you're holding your girlfriend's hand, I'm sure you're not like, mm, you're on the currency clock, babe, you know, <laughs> right? You know? Well, I kind of do. I actually kind of do. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to say that, but... You know, as human beings, we have such romanticized idea about ourselves. And so I don't think that we're often thinking uh, in terms of um, that literal of our, our time and our... But, but, you know, to an extent, that is what we as human beings have, right? To offer uh, anybody else in this world is our time, our talent, and our treasure. Um, but back to my theory that I think money will become obsolete, I'm sure you don't charge your girlfriend if you are out on the town and there's some would-be attackers, and assuming you know, you're able to defend yourself and your, uh, and your girlfriend there, you would not send her a bill later saying, hey, babe, you owe me for the uh, service of protection that I provided you this night. Now, certainly, if you weren't able to protect yourself, I'm sure you're especially not going to bill in that situation. But in the hypothetical that you were able to defend, 
You're not going to send her a bill. When you have kids and you teach them how to use the toilet, you're not going to send them a bill. And if you are uh, the type of person who uh, values your parents enough to let them live with you in their senior years when they're unable to provide for themselves, I don't know, if you had a garden hypothetically and they went and picked a tomato, you're probably not going to charge your mom and dad for the service, I mean for, for that uh, good of the tomato or for the service of being there. Um, I mean, in our in our present system, obviously you might have a financial arrangement, but but my point is, you don't charge your nuclear family money the way that you would strangers. So why does it become necessary? I think as part of our human um, this uh, evolution of social norms that I've talked about, I think part of that will include a desire to want to be more physically healthy and to want to be more mentally healthy. If we are going to have any kind of what might one might call a type one civilization or some type of uh, far uh, uh, more advanced civilization than the prevailing um, idiocracy that seems to uh, you know be prevailing, I think then this means we need healthier people, we need smarter people and I think that um, smarter is going to mean I don't need to trade with you why instead of trade with you why don't I just learn to be as equipped as you are so if you know how to do something on a computer or you know how to do something on an automobile or whatever your skill is um, well I'm I got a brain too so why instead of being dependent and trading with you why don't I instead just learn the same skill set that you have and become as utmost equipped and I think that desire to be utmost equipped will be a different social norm whereas right now the desire often in American culture lifestyle is to be as lazy as possible and to have the hard work be done by other laborers while we you know use our money to you know we didn't have to go dig for those rare earth minerals in our cell phone but we'll go buy it you know you know what I'm saying so I think that the social norms are just going to change again this is just theory I you know and I think that part of the theory the reason I, I hold this theory so passionately is because um, as people talk about emancipating from statism, getting rid of government, a lot of that rhetoric, I don't know about your podcast, but a lot of the rhetoric I've heard elsewhere is about, you know, yeah, we don't want rulers, we don't want centralized authority, we don't want these people telling us what to do. Um, well, then why would you want a boss to tell you what to do? Why would you want any kind of boss uh, employee hierarchy? And I don't know how that wouldn't be centralized power. So you pose the question to me how how money could exist without uh, force and I did my best to tell you uh, the answer with voluntarism but I don't see how you can claim resources or land without that being uh, a central authority or in effect central authority. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry Jeff. Uh, all I, uh, I do know that I think um, I, I guess I want to end it with this um, is that uh, I think in the end, if if we got rid of the state, if people were uh, morally conscious enough to end the state, end corporations, and end religion, because again, uh, statism is the ultimate religion. I think we all agree on that. Um, if we got rid of all three of those, what we'd end up with is the market. Um, still, uh, we'd still have um, currencies and monies um, and money being an idea, money being um, uh, speaking to one another, um, conversing and helping one another. Um, I think we're all on the same page on that because that would be where we'd end up with. Now the end goal that you have includes to get rid of the market and I think that over time um, the market would probably fade and the reason why is because money would appreciate in value um, so much. Um, silver and gold and that kind of thing if at least would appreciate in value and uh, people would be able to treat, trade on just a dime for you know a loaf of bread again. Uh, that kind of thing, and actually, that value would, you know, it would just increase over time, and therefore, you'd end up needing, you know, sixteenths of an ounce for bread and that kind of thing. It would just end up wiping 
out um, the need for money. I think that's what would happen. I don't think it would happen voluntarily. I think it would happen over time because of economics, just that. Right. Um, I, but I, I would, you know, you talked about that exchange, and I, in that scenario, I would say, why would one person need to have this imaginary money, be it gold, silver, Bitcoin, whatever? Um, why wouldn't they just be as equipped to uh, create the bread themselves? And I, pardon me if we're running out of time, and I'm sorry I'm so long-winded at times, but the, the last part of this conversation, and I don't know if you have time now or we could online elsewhere or some other time, but the last part of the yeah. conversation I would then have is the question of, um, is land ownership com compatible with non-aggression principle? How can you claim ownership of land if we're all born onto earth equally by whatever our source of creation is? And whether you do homesteading or whether you declare a many acres of land your own land how do you do that without that being an act of aggression and why should I recognize um, a person's self-declared imaginary boundary of what their supposed property is uh, any more than you know respecting that of what the state forces us to and then um, that leads to the question right. of that transition period of statism I mean, excuse me, of what we presently live in statism now to a post-statism era, well, who is the owner of the resources? I mean, are we starting from scratch? Is it a transition? And either way, how do you claim ownership of the coal mine or the, the pit that has the rare earth minerals or the garden or whatever? How do you claim ownership of that without that being an act of aggression towards everyone who's born onto this earth equally? Right, yeah, and uh, we definitely can talk about that uh, if uh, you'd be uh, so kind as to come on the show again uh, maybe next month or uh, in the future I'm not sure what uh, time available um, it, could be a great, it could be a great topic for the roundtable oh yeah absolutely that's another thing um, we have a roundtable discussion uh, once a month uh, at the beginning uh, of the month uh, the first Monday uh, if you'd like to join us then uh, that's up to you excellent thank um, you yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, just to wrap up the show, I need to go over the prices. All right, last time uh, we did the show was uh, January 12th, uh, and tonight I took these, uh, tonight being January 19th, I took the prices at 817. Uh, last week's silver was 1659. Tonight it's 1768. Uh, the, so that's $1.09 change. Uh, that's 6.6%. That's the highest we've seen in a long time. Gold uh, went from 12.3301 to 12.7530. That's a $42.29 gain, 3.4 percent. And Bitcoin went from 264.53 to 211.93. That's 52.60. That it went down. That's 19.9 percent, 20 percent. So uh, yeah, big changes here, and. Um, Anyway, uh, that about does the show. Uh, so uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, and Jeff, uh, where can we find you? Jeff for Justice. That's the number four, not the word for. And I'm on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook, or JeffForJustice.com. Joshua and Michael, thank you guys uh, for inviting me on and also all you're doing to educate and open minds about self-ownership and voluntarism and emancipation from the state. And I... Uh, even though we disagree about some of these things, I appreciate the opportunity to learn from you guys and dialogue with you. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah. I'm going to plug something, a project that I have in the works. Um, officially, yeah. officially launches tomorrow. Um, it's a show called Abolishing Authority with Michael Freeman. Basically the same kind of platform we have going on here. I'll just be a little more, well, edgy, for lack of a better word. Um, I'm a little less clean cut than Josh is over here, so expect some debauchery, um, <laughs> especially this week, huh? Yeah, so uh, t tomorrow tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, I'll be joined by Derek J. Freeman. Nice. Wow. Right on. Yeah, uh, so uh, next show, uh, who do we have on, Michael? I think it's Jeff Tucker next week. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah so we have uh, Jeff Tucker... Uh, he's from the Mises Institute. He's a uh, he's an anarchist. Uh, he likes to drink bourbon in the morning, specifically. Uh, he likes uh, uh, he got me to uh, shave actually without uh, shaving cream. Uh, that that I got to bring up. That's going to be Ooh. interesting. But um, 
anyway, that's next time. Uh, so uh, that live show will be January 26th. This show right here will be airing uh, January 21st, 3 p.m. on Wednesday. So uh, thank you all for watching. Take care.